Um, hi, uh, I'm a, we're just going to start by introducing ourselves. I'm Amanda Rosa. I'm the digital managing editor at the, Flor the Independent Florida Alligator. I'm Christina Morales. I'm the engagement managing editor. I'm Devon Satute, the Metro editor. Yeah, so um, the Independent Florida Alligator, just so you guys know, is like, um, our, it's like an independent student newspaper uh, from the University of Florida. We have about a staff of 40 people. Um, and so we took on um, the Pointer College Media Project, um, I think, which was offered to eight schools. And it's pretty much a community project of, you know, us exploring the divide between two different sides of Gainesville, um, which is where uh, UF is located, and how the university is like an institution kind of plays into that divide. There's a lot of racial tension between the two areas, a lot of div differences in development. Um, the university is affecting a lot of how the community and the city kind of work together to retain students. So um, that's a little bit about that. So um, we didn't apply for it, but in case you guys were interested in applying for it, um, I asked my editor who did, and she says that some of the questions that they consider a lot when they choose newsrooms for the project is um, why are you deserving of it? And you got to really explain that. And then you also have to think about some of the past conf conflict or society or social issues that you've covered. So a lot of the stuff that like all of the past presentations have talked about like could really fit into covering the project in the future. Um, you got to think about the divisive or underrepresented communities in your area and how you would cover that as a student newsroom. And then um, just like I said a little earlier, our project explores the east and west sides of Gainesville, um, segregation versus integration in our area. There's still a big divide in public schools um, in terms of race and resources and how our university is affecting the community at large. Um, the benefits of this project is that you guys will like, if you do it, or you do something similar, I guess, um, it really bumps up like your ability to do enterprise reporting. Um, and it also helps with sourcing and underrepresented communities, especially if like your student newspaper is one of the only ones still left in a community. Um, so that's kind of really important to shaping those future relationships and um, getting you guys to do that. So you wanna talk a little bit about management for it? Okay, or, yeah. or, 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 or whatever. So, <laughs> so um, something that's really worked for us is like we publish three days a week, but we still have online content every day. And so we've had to incorporate a lot of the stories into our daily coverage. So if even if it's not just for this project, but at least for us with major projects like this, uh, instead of waiting, instead of pu pushing your staff to do the sto these stories for the project and their own stories, you could just publish them as you go and not like, you don't have to reveal it all at the end if you wanna do a big project. We also had to adjust our team and do an audience engagement team and a multimedia team. We're planning a forum for our project. Um, we've done live streams on Facebook and um, we've shared roundups of our stories on Instagram stories, Twitter and Facebook. And so that kind of gives uh, the community an idea of what the project is about and what kind of impact that's gonna have. Um, we've also done a lot with Facebook groups where you would like do call outs into these groups. Um, you want to talk about your multimedia team? Yeah, so also what we've been doing with the project, we specifically hired a programmer, a graphic designer, a and a videographer to help us cover these projects. I'll just show you. Yeah. So these are, how do you do this? Oh, I did it right. So these are some of the stories that we've done so far. Um, and these are also like incorporated into our daily coverage. Historically, the alligator has done feature Fridays. So essentially a reporter will have a feature that they work on throughout the entire week and then we publish it on Friday in the paper. So some of these are like long form features, like over a thousand words that we've done in the past. And also with this project, um, we've had different sections of our newspaper involved in it as well. Um, the Avenue is our entertainment section. Um, they did this story that's in the top left and oh, and the one in the middle. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the whole top row they did. I did it on purpose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the one on the bottom. And the one on the bottom. Okay, so, uh, the, so yeah, they focus on entertainment. Like the Hippodrome is a historical site in Gainesville, which by the way, is this, it's a city in North Central Florida to add some context. 
uh, Leonardo's by the Slice is like this, essentially like a cultural icon in Gainesville. And it was recently bought by, the property it's on was bought by the university along with the gas station right next to it. So the university is gonna turn this pizza joint into the new school of music. Um, and we've had um, a lot of reporting into the community of Gainesville itself, which is what we really wanna focus on. Like Pleasant Street is a historic district that's in Gainesville, it's predominantly black and historically, I believe it was actually like a Freeman Society. Mm -hmm. um, and then also covering pretty like relevant and breaking news coverage as features like a the two cent no the half Excellent. cent tax in Gainesville which is supposed to help fund schools that histor that haven't really been funded and fixed them up so a big part of the pointer project and a big part of how the alligator operates is that the university in most times in our project is not at the center of our stories especially for my department in metro um, a lot of the stories that we're working on now focus on the community as the community, and then we do the same thing at the Alligator. We cover the community as the community. The university doesn't need to be there for all of our stories because we have a very thriving population outside of that, and they're a big part of our readership also. Mm -hmm. So for some of the stories that we're working on now, um, in the bottom right you'll see is a series on living in Gainesville. Uh, it's a four-part series. The first one was on homelessness. The second one was on student housing. Our third one is going to be on residential housing. And our fourth one is going to be on affordable housing. Each one of them highlights the issues and serious problems that people are facing in our community with these types of things. Um, we also talk about uh, food insecurities in Gainesville. It's the top left one. Food banks, food shortages, stuff like that. Um, some of the stories that we're actually working on right now to finish in our community is a story on our poorest area. It's called East Side. It's mostly where uh, the black community lives in Gainesville. We're talking about their community programs, what they're doing to help the disenfranchised <laughs> children and people that live there. We're doing another story on building developments, uh, building developments being hotels, restaurants, that type of thing coming into Gainesville in the next couple of years. We're doing another story on environmental um, projects that are coming in because for some reason our city wants to be waste free by 2045 which means that everything you use will be reused in a complete circle. So there will be no wasting of anything. So we're, there's a lot of functions of the project and a lot of stories we're going at right now, trying to cover every facet and extreme issue that's going on in Gainesville and Alachua County. Yeah. Gainesville's yeah. fun. Go back. Go back to what? This is the first one. Oh. So, um... So yeah, a lot of it is like we're dividing it into the past, the present, and the future because our past, um, we've had issues of race um, on our campus um, and in the community. So we want to still reflect that while transitioning to how those issues relate to the present and how then they're going to in turn relate to the next generation and the future of our, our campus. So um, we've set deadlines and expectations for the staff. We have pointer meetings with them and we also kind of like narrowed down the project to like a timeline of stories like all those stories we've already published we're looking to probably have about 30 stories or so for the whole project and put them under these windows of present past present and future um and so i guess if you want to do this it's I guess here's some things to expect there's a director from pointer that's really helpful and she comes and visits every once in a while you have two semesters to finish the whole project. You get a $3,000 grant as your budget, and that helps a lot with public records, planning a forum. Um, we hired a coder and some extra staff to kind of help out with the creating the website. And um, you get free lectures from Pointer on like social media and reporting in the community, which is kind of cool. Um, they asked us to also talk about diversity a little bit. Um, and especially for this project, you really needed to do that. So the, um, as the engagement managing editor, I'm in charge of the diversity at the paper. So when I started, I was only one of two Latina reporters in there and a staff of 40 people. And I really made that my goal this semester to change that. So now we have four Latina reporters. We have an Asian American reporter. We have Devon, who's a black editor. And um, Amanda and I are both uh, Latina engagement managing editors. So we're kind of leading the paper on this diversity route. Um, so in case you guys were like looking to increase your diversity, which helped with our project a lot because we're doing a story on Asian American community. We're doing a story about the black community. We're doing a bunch of different stories that we wouldn't have done before. Um, I guess here's a little bit about what's worked for us. 
Um, you got to think about diversity as more than like race and ethnicity. Um, it's about different majors. It's about um, different points of view. Um, our paper tends to lean more on the liberal side. So sometimes it's best to bring in that conservative point of view to cover things as well. Um, you got to seek out talent through uh, professors. You have to visit classrooms and be there in person. Um, so a lot of times like a professor would recommend to me I meet with these three people. One was Latina, or one was uh, Black, or one was Asian, American. And then I would meet with them, and I'd take them out for coffee, and we talk about future opportunities at the student newspaper. It takes some time, but it's about really being face-to-face, -face, which is what I've learned. It's not about sending an email to the, the NHJ or NABJ and saying, do you, want to apply, do you have any people who want to apply? It's about being there and meeting with these people and talking to them about what has worked for you. Because if they see somebody in a position of success, um, they will let, emulate that. So it really motivates people. Um, we noticed that in between a year, so in the spring of 2018, I think there was about 11 applications for staff. And then this year, there was about 80 applications for staff. Um, just by going to classrooms and talking to people, meeting with them for coffee, asking professors for recommendations. Um, we're starting a little bit with um, looking into people in high schools as well. Um, you can get involved with maybe talking to people at their student newspapers and seeing if they would like any help or professional advice. Um, and that could also lead to some recruitment efforts. Um, I know our dean is also doing a little bit about that, so we're looking into that. Um, oh, and also something that I've noticed, especially in terms of diversity, is that it's something that you can't really fix really in one semester. Yeah. It's a historical thing. If you, like the University of Florida, for all intents and purposes, it's a PWI, it's a predominantly white institution. The College of Journalism is also predominantly white. So historically, our newsroom, which tends to be journalism students, is and was predominantly white. So something that you need to actively do yourself and that you have to kind of instill in the upcoming staff members, this is something that you also need to really promote and work on because it takes it does take a lot of work and it takes a lot of care to focus on the legacy of the paper and what you really want to focus on um, and ultimately it helps coverage and it makes you a better newspaper and journalist yeah um, so something that I'm also doing is be creating reports of, of diversity and like I said like you are what you attract so if you are like a diverse candidate if you are a minority in like a really like good position at your paper, like be active in reaching out, not even just as like an editor, but be as like a staff writer, a photographer, anybody. Reach out to other minorities who are interested in becoming journalists, but don't know how to get there and, you know, be their mentors and help them get there. And you'll see that the, the applications not only become more competitive, but like you get that diverse newsroom, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of watching out from like beyond you know, just college into like even high school. But there's still always room for improvement at our newspaper. Our opinions columnists are generally white women. Um, there's also gender gaps in sports and news. There's only one, uh, one woman in sports right now. The other one's at an internship. Um, we, and then our news area is mostly women. Devon is the only uh, the only uh, man in our editorial department. <laughs> and so um, another way to do that, like I said, is to create positions to bring in professionals from other different colleges. So we've created this coder position. We have a computer science major. Um, we have, you know, social media manager. So we bring in somebody that specializes in social media. So you could bring in people just from outside of the journalism spectrum. Um, yeah. They also wanted us to talk a little bit about the Parkland coverage and our mass shooting coverage recently. So we included a slide. I don't know if you guys are interested in that, but um, so <laughs> I might as well talk about it because it's up. Yeah. But I mean, do you want to? I'll do it. Uh, okay. Or, yeah. So basically, um, UF has a lot of students who are from Parkland and also from Broward, um, which obviously is in Florida. And most people who go to UF know somebody who's from Broward, know somebody who's from Parkland or who was affected by the shooting in some way. Um, my, my sister was in high school at the time of this shooting, not, in, not at MSD, but at a different high school in Broward County. Um, so when the news broke of the mass shooting in Parkland, we, a lot of 
our staff were <laughs> literally in classrooms. It happened in the middle of the day for us. So it was a lot of reaching out to students on Twitter who were tweeting about it, trying to figure out people who we already, people who we knew who were in MSD or in Broward and, and the area, see if they knew anything. It was really hectic. It was very, very confusing. Um, but at the end, when we found out what happened, we realized that this is something that we really have to cover because and it was essentially aftermath coverage since we were so far away from where it happened. Um, at the time, or at least right now, there's more than 200 students who currently go to UF who, are, who went to MSD. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it ended up being localizing national coverage, especially when the March for Our Lives movement kicked off. Parkland ended up being this really unique and in its own way, strange situation of its own community, mainly of students who are still in high school who mobilized themselves to do this huge national thing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so yeah. like for the breaking news coverage, you know, we did that traditional breaking news story, even though we're about four four hours from Parkland because of that large community in Gaines in our UF. But in terms of the aftermath coverage, we found that one of the victims of the shooting, Carmen Shentrop, was supposed to go to UF. We did an obit on her. Um, I did a feature myself on a Parkland student. Um, I did my, a feature myself on a Parkland student who um, had PTSD after the shooting and was in the same classroom as Carmen. Um, and then we've been localizing all the news coverage, like you said, like the mental health um, story that we already did Okay, so we did a mental health story about um, after the suicides, but I guess some tips like generally is to like give the survivors a platform to speak, like don't come in with a projected story idea and give them the space they need to recover. We recently received criticism from the, some of the March for Our Lives movement because we had reached out to them about um, the recent suicides and they did not want to talk, so we gave them that space. And then just keeping track of anniversaries of shootings and the March for Our Lives movement. So yeah. And that's that on that.